Right. So welcome back. Uh, uh, hope you enjoyed your coffee uh, and you are now more energetic to ask more questions. <laughs> so yes, um, we have uh, the opportunity to invite uh, Dr. Mihao Mesh. He's, uh, now his presentation would be a bit different from the, what you have been hearing till now. Uh, he is not a hydrologist. He is working as a simulation engineer at Hendrop Self Pierce Revetting Atlas Copco UK Limited in the United Kingdom. Uh, he uh, works, um, uh, his role revolves around numerical simulations uh, of the SPR process, which you have to ask him what it is, and associated equipments. Currently, Mihal is involved in collaboration with multiple research institutions in the whole Europe, whole of Europe. Uh, the, the previous work of uh, Dr. Mihal is associated with ERDF TEM project, uh, which aims at uh, prov providing state aid support to SMEs in the region. So that's small and medium industries. He investigated advanced production methods with special focus on superplastic form forming, additive manufacturing, and synthesis of WC powder alloys. Any questions on all those, you need to ask him. Don't ask me. Um, he was involved in collaboration with industry around production process of various elements. His experience also includes FEA, CFD, additive layer manufacturing, diffusion bonding, synthesis of WC powders, metals forming, high performance computing, virtual reality, and various materials and, and analysis methods. So he is one of the um, key uh, presenters here who will be presenting on different advanced tools and mechanisms that has been used by the industry in order to help uh, um, the um, help the um, small and medium industries, and also how those tools can be utilized for uh, re building resilience, uh, to enhance resilience, how those tools can be utilized in the flood risk resilience and management formats. So I leave the floor to uh, Dr. Mish, and uh, welcome Dr. Mish to our Waters uh, um, presentation. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, first of all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Namrata, thank you for this really good introduction with lots of questions to be asked. That might be interesting later on. Uh, I will share my screen now with you and uh, let's start the presentation. As Namrata mentioned, my name is Michał Misz. Currently, I work with a company called Atlas Cop Co. Uh, industrial assembly uh, solutions. Uh, my part of this is quite a big uh, multinational company. Uh, we also have our uh, our fraction in uh, Brazil. We produce and sell compressors on Sao Paulo suburb. Uh, what my part of the company does is we are producing rivets and riveting uh, equipment. Myself, I work with numerical simulations uh, associated with the uh, whole process and uh, the equipment we are using. The project which results I would like to uh, show you is uh, ERDF-TEM, which is uh, European Regional Development Fund, and TEM stands for Transport Engineering Manufacturing. Uh, what did we do? <clears throat> we had some uh, pot of money in which uh, we were spending in the way that we were providing uh, interventions to the small and medium companies in our region. Each intervention was uh, supposed to be minimum of 12 hours, but we went up to a few hundred hours. I don't remember which one was the biggest, but it was within hundreds of hours. What could have been included? That was researchers' time, machine time, consumables, use of software, use of, you name it, um, even some commute time. And that was uh, as a specialist advice for the companies. Everybody could have benefited on that because that was beginning collaboration between small companies 
between university and the industry. And that was as a collaboration between University of Derby and Loughborough University. This way, both a uh, company and the uh, SME could see how do we feel working with each other in very, very safe manner without taking much risk. As I mentioned, the whole intervention did not cost the company usually a single penny, except their uh, fuel or commuting uh, costs to the university. Let's take a quick glance at the uh, SMEs in the uh, UK. Later on, we will try to translate it to the situation in Brazil. Small and medium size, sized enterprises are 95% of total number of businesses in the UK and 52% of total employment, 47% of total business revenue. It's loads of revenue and loads of companies. But again, if you think that only 0.5% is responsible for uh, over 50% of the revenue, the big companies, you can feel the uh, change in the proportions. Most of UK's innovation uh, comes from SMEs. The big companies are not so adventurous. And usually, if we are talking about uh, SMEs, we are talking also about a very close relationship between, uh, <clears throat> between worker and the uh, company owner. They very often know each other on face-to-face -face basis, uh, enjoy their life together, maybe they are neighbors. What is important in case of SMEs is that uh, these are always local people creating local enterprises and they are answering local needs. What exactly is available in the spot? What exactly is needed in the spot? They are able to provide uh, all uh, possible good things only for the companies. How does it look like in Brazil? In Brazil, it's very similar. As you see, 60% of all formal employment uh, gives us about uh, 56.4 million uh, of formal posts. This is uh, several times more than in case of uh, whole UK's population. 99% of enterprises would be uh, defined as SMEs and 20% of uh, GNP, which translates to 20, 320 billion USDs, is generated by uh, SMEs. In Brazil, technology is growing role uh, in case of SMEs uh, presence and entrepreneurship is growing career choice. It's not a necessity. It seems like be having own business is third top desire of Brazilian people according to the recent surveys. And Sao Paulo is having the largest and the fastest share of growing SMEs in Brazil. The status of SMEs in Brazil is not really clear. It's defined by Instituto Brasileiro de Geografia e Estatística. I'm hoping I did not kill Portuguese. Uh, sorry if I did, uh, but there is no legal basis for that. So the uh, statistical uh, uh, office had to find their own definition. But let's go to the merit. SMEs are having very significant challenges. First of all, they are competing with corporations, which is very uneven. Corporations have money, they have time, they have experience, they have lawyers, they have people, and they can lobby at the government, something that is very difficult for small companies. Also, second uh, challenge is shortage of qualified staff. What happens very often in the UK, and I'm sure that in Brazil uh, there is the same problem, it's difficult to find qualified people to work for qualify, at qualified level for the right money. Of course, you can have good people, but you would uh, straight away and almost from the next doors, but you would have to pay them fortune. No SME can afford that, of course. Uh, many SMEs have to hire people from outside of the UK, which can be problematic from formal side and from legal uh, status. Usually, the small and medium companies are way more focused on day-to-day -day, uh, application of the technology than development of technology from the concept. They are using more off-shelf uh, products to create something more. 
and SMEs have no resources for research and development. They have to focus on day-to-day -day basis. That was a common uh, feedback from different companies that they simply did not have time to think about uh, development of new technologies because they were struggling to uh, work out the production they were they were uh, facing. And of course, requirement on comprehensive holistic approach. What I mean by that, in case of big company, you are having one department which is HR, one department which is uh, which is uh, marketing, somebody from public relations, etc., etc., etc. Usually, there are groups of people. In case of five people company, there is one owner who does everything in the company, and everybody else is being coordinated by this single person. So suddenly, one person have to be able to do everything which in case of big companies is done by uh, tens if not hundreds of people. <clears throat> Let's uh, see company A. Actually, I will make closer to your history of three companies uh, with whom I worked and to whom I provided the interventions. Uh, the company A is uh, producing large polymer objects by rotational casting. What is rotational casting? Uh, you can see on the uh, picture two big uh, silver gray barrels uh, connected with each other by on the blue arm. These barrels are heated up. Inside you put usually some pellet or powder polymer, heat it up, melt the uh, polymer and then start rotating it all around. It's like if you put some water into the balloon and start rotating it around. Soon you will end up with a very nicely and very uniformly distributed film of uh, polymer on the whole surface of the uh, drum. Then you can inject another portion of the polymer to create another layer. This way you can create composites. Then you can fill it up with foam, with another substances, with gases, whatever you may you wish to. What can be what is typically made this way? Fluid containers, boats, furniture and others. And obviously, as every company, they are always looking for new customers. <clears throat> How did we help them? Uh, they came to us with uh, one request, 3D printing of models. So they were able to showcase the models on the national level exhibitions and uh, showcase the models to the customers. And also they were looking for some advice on 3D printing, what they can do and cannot do. What was the effect of our uh, intervention is that we created a number of tactile models for them. They were able to go around the whole UK with those uh, plastic models and show it to their customers. Also, what happened is that they were able to confirm the shape. And here I can share with you some, um, for some people, funny story uh, about shape confirmation. Uh, when I used to work with virtual reality, there was a company who was producing ships. As you know, modern uh, ships, especially big cargo ships, they are made this way, they are having double uh, hull. And during the presentation of VR uh, model, it turned out that uh, the hull that should be on the inner side was slightly bigger than the hull that should be on the outer side. So it was uh, kind of as if you would put sweater in the wrong way around. So this way the customers were able to sit down at the uh, drawing boards and redesign it properly to shrink down the inner hull. It allowed them to save a uh, million pounds on the uh, single, uh, simple mistake of the scale. For, fortunately, they were able to confirm the shape and confirm everything. The same here, we can 3D print two different models, two different elements and check if they fit together. The company also got very good grounded knowledge on additive manufacturing and they were able to reach to the customers in much better way than previously. Company B uh, is producing domestic plumbing equipment. On the picture you can see the uh, part of piping uh, system. I need to give you a little bit of introduction here too. 
Uh, in the UK, when we are using uh, the boilers for heating water for domestic use, for washing, or for heating up houses, these boilers sometimes overheat. And in such situations, they need to dump the hot water to the sewage uh, and uh, pump in cold water to be able to protect themselves from uh, burning down uh, crucial elements. And then the company came to us, uh, invented the tan dish, which you can see, uh, this is this trapezoidal or hexagonal element in the middle of the picture. And so uh, the customer can see the water flowing via through this tan dish, as previously it was just a pipe uh, leading to the sewage or to the outside. And nobody could have seen uh, flowing water. Here you can see flowing water. And what happens? We know that the tan dish is strong enough and made of material which can withstand over 120 degrees from, for prolonged time. But we were not sure about the piping around it. So we had to check if the pipes around it are able to withstand it. Will they melt? Will they bend too much? And, and <clears throat> we had to check this uh, compatibility with current plumbing system. What did we do? We selected a bunch of materials which are currently being used in British uh, heating systems, performed some analytical calculations to estimate uh, by analysis if uh, the polymer will heat up that much to be in danger of zone. Then we wanted to perform numerical simulations. Uh, this is final element and computational flight dynamics and experimental series. On the picture, you can see uh, different graphs. You can see that some polymers will reach up to 90 degrees. Some will not reach. But some of those uh, polymers can withstand only 70 degrees. And that's the problem. So we had to be able to show the company. This, this uh, calculations are actually theoretical calculations with constant 100% contact of the water with the uh, polymer. Uh, flowing water is very, especially in vertical pipes, is very rarely touching 100 percent. Uh, usually, it's some mixture of water and air, so we are in better situation. This will, this can be done by FEM or CFD. What will happen in such uh, situation, or you can estimate it as an effect. We were able to provide the customer information on the pipe compatibility. Also, we planned experimental procedures, planned experimental uh, regime, how to assess and how to confirm the findings experimentally. Company C uh, is part of supply chain of one big multinational OEM producing uh, aerospace elements. The company is, uh, with whom we worked is producing elements of airplane elements. I cannot explain it in a better way. Uh, they are mostly working with CNC machining. So what they usually do is they are taking uh, quite a big slab of aluminum, steel, titanium in the CNC machine and uh, cutting it, uh, carving so long until they will get the desired shine of the uh, final element whether it's some type of bracket, some blade, some fastener, whatever it is. Obviously, I'm having here timing uh, changing. Sorry, I'm having here timing changing of the slides. It will be switching. I don't know how to turn it off at this moment. Uh, obviously, this uh, machining requires uh, produ production of expensive jigs and fixtures to hold the elements in appropriate way, which demands lead time. It costs lots of consumables and produces lots of waste to produce the jigs and fixtures. The company requested us again if we could help them with 3D printing technology to do these jigs and fixtures. What did we do? We sat down properly at the desk. We checked available standards. Uh, it turned out very quickly that there is uh, very few, if any, av available world standards for uh, 3D printing for aerospace. 
we got involved into creation of those standards to be able to provide some information and to be able to know ourselves uh, how the things work. Also, we did survey available technologies, available materials, and how 3D printing compares with rot or cast materials. How 3D printing fits with current supply chain. What I mean by that, what do we do with the 3D printing uh, elements after we 3D print them, if we can use them straight away, if we need to process them further? What do we do with 3D printing uh, materials before it comes to uh, put it to the 3D printing machine? How do we handle the feedstock? We researched not only metal, we researched plastic, ceramics. Uh, also, we checked different available technologies. For example, uh, 3D printing is one of them, but we checked uh, ultrasonic lamination technologies of metal uh, strips. Then we went for workshops where that was quite interesting experience because we were able to interact with uh, people who came to us from the industry, uh, showcase them some 3D printing and uh, speak with them. What are they need, their needs and how we can give them hand? What are their questions? What are the concerns? Finally, we prototype case study <clears throat> for the company. Obviously, we 3D printing some jig. What was the effect for this particular company? Again, significantly increased awareness of 3D printing within this organization. Uh, the key employees and uh, their colleagues were able to uh, answer now many questions about uh, 3D printing. Also, the tactile prototype was important for the company because they were able to showcase it on a far more air show. This is one of the biggest, uh, world's biggest air shows where uh, we are having uh, visitors from all over the world. And they were able to benchmark it between technologies with different 3, 3D printing and CNC machining. Cost effectiveness, time effectiveness, and most importantly, what was the what was the uh, dimensional accuracy of uh, our uh, 3D prints compared with different 3D prints and CNC machining. This is insanely important in case of aerospace elements. You don't want anything to go wrong in your airplane. And obviously the company gained uh, accessibility to way more rapid production of their jigs and fixtures. As a result of the whole uh, project or uh, for all the companies we I just presented to you, we were able to significantly reduce uh, time between nucleation of idea and use. By decreasing leak time of tooling production, production and faster introduction of the new products to the market. Also, uh, newly designed uh, products uh, like this uh, Tandish can be better customized for the needs of particular location or application. This is also important for the 3D printing. You can 3D print bespoke elements. Reduction of waste and required raw materials. The same here. We don't need to transport everything, which is especially important in case of a situation when there are problems with infrastructure. We don't need to <clears throat> produce everything. We can save material uh, and translate it to direct saving of the uh, production cost. We increased awareness of 3D printing and other and other novel technologies within the companies, which is uh, very often um, important uh, to do. Also, tactile prototype was uh, important for the companies, as I mentioned. Companies became way more competitive between their own colleagues and also more competitive into the uh, competition with big companies. They became more resource effectiveness, which is very important as well. And as I mentioned, products are, can be way easier introduced to the locations with limited infrastructure. Why? Because we are just transporting uh, production machines, which can be fragile and can 
can be uh, difficult to transport, but once we pr uh, transport the machine, which can very often, in case of 3D printers, fit in the cardboard, we can 3D print way more fragile elements on site without any additional transport. We just need to deliver feedstock, which is, in case of 3D printing, very often in form of filament, in form of powder, uh, resin. Also, uh, we provided higher stability on the market and employment. The companies, because they are able to be more competitive, uh, they feel uh, that they are able to promise uh, better job for their workers. How does it tie up with uh, resilience? And obviously, resi resilient enterprises contribute to resilient society. If we are able to build also the resilience within the society just after uh, or, ju or during the uh, hardship times, we are able to uh, make the society uh, way better working afterwards. In my country, we have this uh, proverb that real friends you will meet in situation when you are in problem. And the same here. People bind together in hardship times and they start trusting each other better. More rapid post-flooding recovery. <clears throat> Obviously, we can produce customized items to fill in miss missing or damaged uh, objects like in the uh, workshop. Something can be taken by the flood. Let's 3D print replacement. Let's 3D print um, custom equipment prepared for better uh, production or more rapid evacuation. Waterproof casings, uh, floating casings, uh, or uh, handles, instead of uh, trying to pack everything one by one, we can uh, bind things together in one handle and grab it together and uh, move it in a way easy way. Better resource efficiency, obviously. We are saving materials, but also we are saving all resources associated with fuel, with energy. All of us know how important it is to have uh, energy saved in places where there is no electricity. I have to mention also that this uh, project has been uh, co-founded by European Union and it was uh, innovation through collaboration uh, by University of Derby and University of Loughborough. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm hoping you found it interesting. Uh, if you have any uh, questions, please, this is now time to ask them. Also, I would like to say thank you to uh, our Brazilian host in uh, at the university and Dr. Uh, Namrata, who uh, prepared the uh, event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Michal. Uh, could you uh, please stop sharing and uh, we would like to see you now instead of the slides, please. Yes, give me a second. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, which is a bit different from what we have been hearing from uh, yesterday. Uh, there were no flood uh, pictures of flooded people. There were no pictures of uh, um, a conceptual model, or there were no pictures of uh, 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 long... Oh, no, there is a graph. Yes, of course, you being an engineer, and as we all know, we have to have a graph. But uh, I think that was... Um, quite interesting to see how new technologies could be used in uh, we saw examples of three different kinds of industries um, uh, but uh, could you explain a little bit more on how such technologies like 3d 3d printing and things like uh, uh, virtual reality all those new advanced technologies can be used uh, more um, uh, for developing countries, because there is obviously a, um, a problem with cost. Most probably these technologies come at a price. Uh, so how do you think uh, developing nations like Brazil, India, uh, how can these countries be able to afford 
uh, such technologies and can be used for uh, society and uh, for re uh, building resilience. Thank you. This is really, really good question. Uh, thank you for asking it, and it touches the very core of the uh, whole mission of the of the of the project. The let me first address the cost of the technologies. Uh, 3D printing itself can be very expensive, yeah. but we need to think about using the right tool for the right uh, purpose. What I mean by that, uh, 3D printing has not been designed to uh, 3D print millions of the same small parts as injection molding or uh, die casting is. 3D printing is designed to produce one-offs or very much customized uh, elements. Only thing that it must produce by 3D printing is, if I remember well, a hip joint femur uh, sockets. Well, that is very good for Brazilian context because we have a lot of footballers here. So, <laughs> um. yes. Uh, so this is this is this is in pathology. But what is important in case of 3D printing is that we are 3D printing almost always one off. All of us, every person in the room is having slightly different shape. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to recognize each other. Yeah. Which means that. In case something goes wrong with our body and we want to create replacement element, let's uh, be technical here, we need to use different shape to fit this element to our body. Yeah. And here comes 3D printing. Mm -hmm. Very often to make this element in any other technology than 3D printing would be insanely expensive, if possible. Yeah. 3D printing is technology of very big freedom of shape. Here we don't need to be concerned, concerned if we are able to drill somewhere, if we are able to uh, cut something, if we are able to get to this spot with this big tool. No, there is no problem here. We are always with our tool where we want to be. Somebody might say, okay, but you will not get to the surface finish. Agreed, you will not get to the surface finish uh, like uh, shining, uh, like mirror surface finish. But our bodies are not shining as well, and our body actually uh, reacts better for rough surfaces. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, uh, let's take a look again at hip replacement uh, in our bones. Uh, you Usually you are having one element which is uh, fitting into your a socket in your pelvis, okay. instead a socket of your pelvis, and there is a bow-shaped element fitting to the socket, an elongated element which is going inside your femur. This elongated element is rough surface, very often porous, so your body can grow inside and your body can integrate with that quite easily. And 3D printing is perfect to create pattern structure, lattice structures, rough structure. So this is cost. I know that I'm talking here a lot about the uh, about uh, biotechnology, but this is just underlining how technology like 3D printing can be used in a relatively cheap way mm -hmm. and how customized it can be. And again, we can customize it not for only for human yeah. uh, shapes. We can customize it for shapes of tools we need, yes. of tools which are missing. From top of my head, let's say we are missing handle of something which is uh, handle of machine, which we need to use on day-to-day -day basis yeah. in our workshop, uh, in carpenter's workshop. Mm -hmm. We can try to get this handle from the producer, wait for two weeks until it will come and pay fortune for the handle itself made uh, of uh, iron or whatever. Yeah. Or we can uh, use uh, 30 minutes of machine time and 3D print it and start using it. It will break. Okay, it will break. Next time you will print another one with different material and start using it again. What is important? 
you are having the handle immediately yeah. or almost immediately. So saving and cost and time. Yeah. Exactly. And the handle, and it doesn't matter uh, what is shape of the handle you need. You can always customize it. Yeah. You didn't like original handle because it was too short. No problem. Print it longer. Yeah, uh, I think that yeah. makes a lot of um, it, it makes it very clear how the technology can be used. Um, it has, mul it is multifunctional basically. It can be used also, in many things. Yes, sorry, carry on. Also, something I wanted to say about the software which uh, we used. Uh, there is very broad uh, mm -hmm. range of software. Uh, maybe you have heard term open source. Oh yes. Uh, which is completely free and community made. Uh, it's not. It's not usually not as fancy as uh, commercial software, but very often with this software, which is completely free, you can uh, you can get very very good results. Okay. Very often you can get way better results than with any other commercial software. Also because you can customize it yourself. Could you could you say the name again, please? Uh, what is the free uh, open source software for three D printing? Oh, there is plenty of open source software for three D printing. Okay. Uh, one of those softwares which I can recommend and is free is Cura. Cura. This is soft Cura. Yes, this okay. is software Futura. to mm. take your three D model. Mm -hmm. Cura. Yes, this is a software uh, to take your 3D model which is already prepared and translate it into language which will be understood by 3D printers. Okay. There is another bit of software called Salome or Open, uh, Open, sorry, Salome or is one software and another software is FreeCAD. Both of them are uh, designer software mm. to create your uh, shape. Okay. Okay, so uh, what I'll do is now I'll open the floor to the uh, to the audience and request them to ask any questions uh, that I see a hand already. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Mariana. Thank you, Michael, for presenta your presentation. And I would like to know if you have ever tested this prototype technology with biomass-based uh, materials, such as fungi tissues for furniture development, or bioplastic from microalgae. Uh, the, the, the reception of your voice is slightly faint, that's why I will try to... Uh, repeat your question. You're asking basically if you can use bio com bio materials for 3D printing. Yes. If he has ever. Oh, if if you have ever tasted uh, tested uh, with such materials uh, in your lab, or have you ever had any experience of uh, using biomass materials? Yeah. I did some work on. I did some work with uh, PLA uh, polymers, and some uh, and some work with uh, starch-based polymers. But that was only application of those polymers derived from starch or otherwise. PLA is biodegradable uh, polymer. If I remember well, it's also bio. Uh, by originated, but I'm not certain about this one. They always work perfectly okay for uh, applications we use them for, and we never had uh, any problems with those. If this is uh, answering your question, uh, important part about 3D printing of polymers is that dependently on your polymer, you can 3D print uh, different things and you need to print things in slightly different way. Uh, and there is also lots of, lots of fiddling with settings to fine tune the settings uh, of your uh, printing. But making long story short, yes, I tested some bio uh, originated uh, materials for 3D printing and they gave good results. 
any Plus, more questions? I know oh. that there is many of those which I didn't test and they <laughs> are really good too. Yeah. Uh, for the, yes, Professor. Well, uh, Michal, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, really, uh, we acknowledge to this family, your family, uh, you and Amrata, you are part, uh, and this family at the university. Uh, my question is related to uh, the new materials and aging infrastructure. Uh, aging infrastructure means the sewage systems, uh, the drainage systems in, in cities, uh, micro systems, uh, micro conduits. Uh, uh, for instance, all Europe, all the United States, uh, mostly South American countries, Asian and African countries are uh, facing the problem of aging infrastructure. That means we have sewage. Um, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I cannot, I, I have me, very big difficulties to understand. Aging. Um, I, I is it not, I, wait, wait. Your I'm, question is quite long and I couldn't hear you okay, properly. Okay, okay. Can you repeat it? Uh, uh, because the reception is bad. Yes, I, I couldn't I couldn't hear okay. uh, words of professor was were floating into one one very rambling sound which I couldn't oh, distinguish. Okay. Couldn't there is there is some difficulties on connection. Okay, okay. We will uh, we will repeat the question uh, about okay. can you hear me properly? Yes, I do. Maybe. It's fine. Well, uh, about aging infrastructure that means aging sewage systems, uh, aging drainage systems. So uh, um, uh, what's your opinion about the uh, um, opportunity in the market to introduce this material in order to uh, uh, replace older systems that which are not working well or not working at all? That means we have problems in, in South America and even in Europe, sometimes for flooding, sometimes for uh, 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 flash floods, not only because it's a big rain, but also because the system is not working properly. Uh, that means they have a not good maintenance or even they have obstructions in the, in the system. So uh, one uh, option in the, on the discussion is to introduce low-cost material to replace the older systems in an easy way and a fast way. That means uh, small-scale uh, systems with new materials. So what's your opinion in terms of the future of this uh, 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 new material, but using in a big scale, that means municipality scale, or even in a region or in a, in a country, because we are dealing with this problem in not on a smaller scale in only one specific point of the country. We are dealing with this problem in all countries, you know, independent or regardless of the, of the flag. Huh? Yeah. Thank you. Your question is very interesting and uh, really close to my heart. Uh, this is something which I would call uh, organic work. Organic work is time when uh, people are themselves starting doing something to make things better. And this is what uh, this is where SMEs are coming, small companies to uh, do things on their own locally. But because there is many, many, many companies all over the country, they are doing things, each company is doing things locally uh, better for themselves. All together they are chipping in. This is the reason why the uh, United States has been so successful during, uh, during uh, 20th century. Because there was lots of small companies and lots of entrepreneurs who were brave enough to take things in their own hands and uh, determined enough to uh, follow on with that. Answering your first uh, part question, uh, first part of your question, which is associated with, as I understand, um, replacement of misdesigned elements by better designed elements. 
please correct me if I'm uh, confusing something here, but this is the 3D printing and uh, technologies like 3D printing are uh, designed to, to provide bespoke elements. And again, uh, flash flooding very often uh, happens uh, in places where something is, uh, <clears throat> when there is something, uh, some small blockage. By replacing this one element which is blocking it, uh, we can uh, contribute significantly to uh, decrease to reduction of flooding, uh, blockage by debris, blockage by uh, narrow throat, etc. Uh, so, if we are in the space and uh, somebody invested lots of money to uh, build the uh, the the, the uh, flood defense, which is His link broke. Okay. Okay. Let's see if we can. The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. Please leave a message after the beep. Hello? Yes, I'm here. The connection went down. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Carry on, please. Uh, answering the first part of the question, uh, once we have uh, once we have infrastructure into which somebody uh, invested uh, gigantic money and uh, it doesn't work, 3D printing is again the technology which can uh, solve many problems because this way we are able to design one single element, one particular spot within the whole system, which can be easily replaced. And in relating... Pardon? No, it's all right. Carry on. Uh, the, the element which we would 3D print might be more expensive than off-shelf element uh, which was replaced. But again, that will not be off-shelf element. That will be highly customized element. Which is uh, which is uh, which is designed for this spot and to produce element like that by the company external company uh, far away uh, might be in way higher cost than uh, producing it on yourself on your own. In case of old installations, it. Uh, there is uh, quite a bit of research when uh, different researchers were using 3D printing to uh, replace elements which are impossible to get anymore as a, as a, as a spare element. As an example here, I can uh, give uh, the gentleman who bought one of the 3D printers, put it in his own garage and now he's producing spare elements for vintage cars. Small coils, small valves, impossible to get off shelf. What he can produce it for you? Uh, thank you. I think uh, what I got—it's not my sector, not my expertise—but of all the discussion that we had. Uh, if if anyone else has any more questions, I'll be happy. He'll be happy to take. Okay, so um, if you come up with any other question, just send him an email. But what, in my opinion, the advantage of 3D printing and technologies like that, this is uh, the customization. When we talk about uh, flooding, we talk about issues, we often talk about local problem, looking at it from uh, the problem, uh, what is very localized. We have heard the uh, in the previous uh, presentation, we have heard that one size does not fit all. So 
I think 3D printing or technologies like that uh, is, uh, um, gives us the real examples of how we can change the size according to uh, the need. And I guess uh, Dr. Mish would also agree with me in this uh, that uh, we can utilize this technology. This is just a tool. Uh, how we use it is on us. And if we can, we want to use it for flood risk reduction, making customized uh, products out of uh, 3D printing technology, that's on us how we utilize that technology. And the reduced cost, once we get the material, once we get the machine, I think is another big advantage of this technology. So uh, I think uh, with that, I will summarize this session. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Mesh again. And uh, shall we give him another round of applause, please? Thank you very much, Dr. Mesh, for joining us uh, today and uh, for accepting our invitation to talk in this workshop. Uh, if any questions come up, I, uh, we will forward it to you or the students can directly contact you because we have your contact information. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, one little comment I would like to uh, give is yes, that a customization is one big advantage. Second big advantage oh. is that everything happens right now and right here. So time you saving. You don't need to transport anything. You don't need to transport anything, and you don't need to wait a long time for uh, building your element. Okay. You really know so how everything to... Everything can be... You everything is instant. You really know how to sell your products. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity to give you this uh, short presentation. I'm hoping you find it interesting. Uh, I would like to hear as much as possible questions from you and feedback because uh, approaching different, uh, this is uh, this is new field for me and I would love to hear as much as possible and learn also from you. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for uh, giving me this possibility. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. It's still day there, right? Have a nice day. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>